um, to uh, many, many young people and, and a real benefit. Um, there was a small business tax credit that was put in place. Hasn't been utilized to a great extent, unfortunately. Um, I, some say it's because it's kind of complicated, but it says that you're a small business, 25 or fewer employees, you have, um, <coughs> you pay 50% of the employee's premium, and you have an average wage of 50000 or less. You can see how it's getting complicated. 35% uh, of what the employer pays for the employee coverage is uh, a, a tax uh, deduction from their uh, corporate uh, income tax. And uh, in that, 35% increases to 50%. So the program will stick around. Um, and, you know, maybe more small businesses uh, will take advantage of it. They targeted small businesses because we know if you're looking at employer-based coverage, it's those small businesses that are, that are least likely um, to, provide, to provide the coverage. Um, the, there were numerous points when the law was being debated where <coughs> anecdotes sort of drove the decisions, and this uh, rescission um, issue was one of those. Uh, rescission means that a, a, a company will do what we call post claims underwriting, and it's a, that's a bad thing. They will go, at, and after you've started submitting claims, they will go and look at your application and see if they can't find a flaw, and then they'll drop you from coverage. Well, that's a bad thing to do. That's, okay. that's not very nice. So we have not, now our department, we think we have sufficient uh, authority in our department to prevent that from happening. And it was not a problem, had not been a problem in Kansas. They have to be able to demonstrate that there's real intent to defraud the company by by withholding information. And you know, this will go away in, in 2014 when health status is not an issue. But So there was a woman in California, the story goes, that she was a beautician. She had employer-based coverage. And she started being treated for breast cancer. And so the company that, I don't know who the company was, um, went back and looked at her um, application form and she had been treated for, somehow they found out she'd been treated for acne as a teenager and they said, you didn't tell us about your being treated for acne as a teenager, <laughs> therefore we're going to drop your coverage now that you're, of course, we're spending, we're spending so much money on your breast cancer treatment. So. It, it was stories like that, and I think it's a good thing to make sure the bar is high. You, you know, fraud, fraud's one thing, but, but dropping someone over a technicality like that is just shouldn't happen. Um, so the bar is the bar's pretty high. Um, the, um, one of the other really popular provisions in, in the early uh, implementation was um, first dollar coverage for preventive services, and there are a list of about 20 various uh, preventive screens, including immunizations, um, that are now offered. Um, colonoscopy, for example, um, can't have a copay. Um, now, the interesting thing is uh, they sh these were changes to existing policies. And an insurance policy is like a legal document. It's a contract. And, the, and you, you sign up and you buy the policy and you pay your premiums and the company then agrees to provide all the benefits that are in that contract. So enforced contracts had to be changed and companies had to notify their insurers uh, by September of 2010 that that policy would, that would no longer charge co-pays and deductibles. So it was, it was sort of interesting. There was a lot of angst about it and the companies were saying, oh, well, these products have already been priced and now you're telling us you have, we have to provide greater benefits turned out to be much ado about nothing, really. The, co the companies are fine and uh, doing fine, and uh, it was not a huge, a huge deal. Um, the, um, one of the other um, popular provisions that, again, was this was a provision that was dropped from an existing policy. If the policy had a lifetime limit, and, you know, with the expense of health care today, people were bumping up against that million dollar or two million dollar lifetime limit. If the policy had a lifetime limit, it had to be dropped. So um, again, and that was in existing existing policies, and that, that was very, very popular. Enhanced appeals procedures, and in fact, um, here's a, this was one of the provisions where our National Association of Insurance Commissioners is actually referenced in the law as, as because we have a model that we adopted. Let me back up just a sec. Insurance is regulated at the state level.
but through our national association, which was founded in 1871, we work in a collaborative fashion. We meet annually three times a year. We meet by a conference call. I mean, sometimes it feels like daily, but for some of the committees, it's, it's certainly uh, weekly, if not monthly. And we, so we try to coordinate our activities and coordinate our efforts because it's insurance companies, for the most part, are big national companies, and it's better for everyone if, if we can promote uniformity where it makes sense. So NEIC was referenced in the law and actually directed to do some certain, certain things, and one of, the, one of the references was on the appeals process, model appeals process that we had in place, and if the state had adopted, there's nothing that says states have to adopt these models that NEIC develops because NEIC doesn't have any governing authority. But it, um, if, if a state had adopted the NAIC recommendation, then that was deemed to be sufficient to, uh, to meet the uh, provisions of the federal law. Uh, there was a um, new high-risk pool created to go along side by side with our Kansas existing high-risk pool, which had been in place since the early 90s. And the high-risk pool is for people who don't have employer-based coverage and are out in the market trying to buy coverage and have a pre-existing condition that causes them to either be priced out of the market or, or not offer coverage at all. And, uh, and unfortunately, that happens. Uh, we have about, in our state existing high-risk pool, we have somewhere between 16 and 1,800. It kind of fluctuates, but uh, existing enrollees. The new high-risk pool has a little over 500, but we've had to cut off new enrollees, and after the end of this year, we won't need these high-risk pools because those people will be absorbed into the normal, into the regular market. But we've had to cut off enrollment because we were given a specific amount of dollars to cover that new high-risk pool. And when those dollars go away, there's no way to replace them. And we didn't want the people that were already enrolled in our high risk, this new high-risk pool um, to be, have their, their claims uh, jeopardized. So it, we felt it made more sense to take care of the ones that were already in and just um, cut off um, the coverage. And the, our existing coverage yeah. pool could still take those folks. Anyway, it's more expensive. That was the, the advantage of going into the new one is that there were limits to out-of-pocket expenses. Um, so, okay, let's, um, let's move to 2014. This is where we're, um, because we're really, the clock is ticking. These things have to be ready. This exchange, all of the new provisions have to be ready and enforced by January of next year. Um, so, 2014, health plans can no longer limit uh, your ability to buy, buy coverage based on your health status. How great is that? The people that need it most can now buy it, uh, instead of those that needed it most couldn't or were priced out of the market because uh, because of the pre-existing condition. So no pre-existing condition exclusion, so no health underwriting. Um, there's what we call guaranteed issue and guaranteed renewability, which just goes hand in hand with that. If the, com if the company's in the market then they, and somebody wants to buy the policy, they have to, um, they're, they are required to, uh, they, can't, they can't deny you coverage. Um, so that um, creates a better marketplace. Yes, ma'am? The pre, with pre-existing conditions, well, we'll talk about that, but there are no price caps. There are no there are no caps, but there are <laughs> mechanisms for pooling people so that you're not rated based just on your your single health status. In fact, you're not rated on your health status at all. Um, so, so that, but I, I will talk about there are four rating factors that, that do come into play. Um, age, tobacco use, geography, and family structure. And uh, in case of age, it's three to one. So, and, and this is only for the under Medicare eligible population, the adult population under 65. Is it for the insurance exchange policies or is it for all policies? All, all policies Thank will you. have to comply with this. Thank you. In and out of the exchange, right. Um, and uh, so it, it's interesting, um, tobacco use, you can, so age is, age is three to one. A, a younger person can't be charged less than a 
a third of what an older person is charged, or an older person can't be charged more than three times what a younger person is charged. And I'll tell you, um, when I had an opportunity to testify in front of Congress, I argued against uh, a three-to-one age rate because we want young, healthy people to buy into the market. And if you price them out of the market, you, you in, a, in a sense, uh, defeat the purpose. So we argued that let's, let's broaden them to begin with, and then you can gradually um, bring it down. Because when, when you're locked in to an age rate like that, what happens as the older end of the spectrum costs more, everybody gets pulled up because of the way the, the rates are, are calculated. So, um, and our concern is we want young, healthy, I mean, the whole idea is to get, expand that pool so that when, when we have more healthier people paying into the pool, it'll help con control the cost for everybody. Um, tobacco use is interesting. It's um, one in a, 1.5 to 1, so um, one and a half um, percent more than um, for someone using tobacco versus someone who doesn't. Now, the American Cancer Society has recently come out against uh, the age rate, the uh, tobacco rating, because they are saying, you know, you really want people who have those health conditions, now that they, they have, of course, brought them on themselves, but you, you don't want to, you want to uh, get them the services they need so that in the long term, hopefully, you can counsel them about quitting smoking and hopefully you can help their um, health status. So they've argued, and states don't have to do that 1.5 to 1. They can, they can rate somebody who uses tobacco the same as, as they do every, everyone else. So I don't know. I have mixed feelings about that, but I think they're, the point is they want, pe they want everyone to, get, to be able to get into the, into the health care system. And of course, uh, geography just recognizes that some parts of the state, some parts of the country, it costs more. You can rate. We can have at least. Uh, we can't have more, but we can have up to seven different geographic rating groups in the state. So presumably, you'll have metropolitan areas, and then how we group counties uh, based on demographics. The state was able to determine how we wanted our our. Um, rating groups to, to look and submit that to, to HHS. Um, and then family structure, obviously, singles versus uh, married with children or married without. Um, there are tax credits and subsidies that will help pay the big premiums, and this goes up to 400% of the federal poverty level, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, for a family of four in Kansas, that's, um, I think, close to $94,000. So. And, and it's, a, it's a gradual, um, so the closer you get to the 400%, of course, the less the subsidy would be. But uh, for someone at 100 to 150% of the federal poverty level, it's a, it's a fairly significant uh, subsidy to help you pay for the coverage. The whole idea here is you, you really can't tell someone they have to buy something if they can't afford it. So this is the way to try to make it, uh, try to make it affordable. And there are limits on out-of-pocket costs in the qualified, in these qualified health plans, and these qualified health plans are the ones, they, they have to be certified that they're meeting all of these uh, federal laws to be qualified health plans, and those are the plans that will be sold both in the exchange as well as um, outside the exchange. And qualified health plans then have to cover essential uh, health benefits. So, the, the, and I, I try to tell, especially business groups, here, this is one of the efforts to try to level the playing field because the business owner who's providing good comprehensive health insurance for their employees is um, ultimately pays more for that good coverage because somebody else is offering a skinny package and it doesn't really cover what people need. So when they get the services they need but it's not covered by insurance, those costs get shifted to those more comprehensive and, and um, generous plans. So this is one area where it's through, it's through saying we're going to have essential health benefits. The, there's a basic level of coverage that all the plans have to cover to try and um, level that playing field. Um, there, when people go to these exchanges, uh, they're going to be, uh, they're going to enter basic income information and, and a zip code. A zip code will tell you whether or not your hospital or doctor is included in the plan that you might be looking at. Income information obviously will 
tell you whether you're eligible for some form of a subsidy. So, um, but you want to be able to compare apples to apples. So another thing that our national association was directed to do was to come up with, with uniform terminology, insurance terminology and, and um, health care, medical terminology, so that when you're looking at the benefits included, now that the essential health benefits have to be there, but companies can di differenti differentiate themselves by um, um, adding benefits, and, and state benefit mandates are not affected by these essential health benefits. As long as they meet the essential health benefits, whatever the state has mandated above and beyond that, um, that's included for that state. So it's um, so the, the terminology is important so that when you're looking at it, you can compare apples to apples. Just imagine if you've ever bought an airline ticket on Expedia or, or Travelocity, it would be very difficult to compare the price of the airline ticket if the if the somehow there were hidden hidden costs that weren't thoroughly explained in that in that pricing. So that's the idea here is to make sure everything uh, upfront, uh, um, easy to understand, and comparable from one plan to another, so that the terms are used, that are, are that are used are the same from one plan to another, and the application form. So the questions that are being asked will be the same from one plan to another, and that was something else that our national association was. Uh, was asked to uh, to come up with. So, key to this, and I go, I'll go back to that point I made at the beginning in, a, in uh, the um, child-only coverage. If you don't tell the families that they need to buy the coverage, then they will wait. And they could potentially wait until the child is sick to buy it, and the company can't deny them. Well, that's also a concern with, um, if you tell companies you can't be denied coverage based on your health status, then why wouldn't you just wait to buy it when you're sick? That's a good economic decision. Why pay all that money for premiums when you don't need them? And then uh, when you get sick, you just buy the coverage, and then when you're well, you drop it. And Well, that really doesn't work. Um, it would be tantamount to buying homeowner's insurance once the house is burning or buying a buying car insurance after you've had the vendor vendor. You need to buy it in advance. And what insurance is, is, is uh, covering a potential need and a potential loss in the case of homeowners and auto. So, um, so the, man the individual mandate was, was, was critical to um, this all working. Um, and, you know, that was one of the um, challenges um, before the Supreme Court last year was that the individual mandate was unconstitutional. And I think, um, you know, court watchers were a little bit surprised that um, Ju Justice Roberts wrote his um, opinion on the, for the majority saying Congress does have the ability. They, didn't cha they weren't challenging the mandate, but they were challenging the, uh, the penalty. And they were saying the, 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 ones that, uh, the folks, the states that were against it, Kansas, unfortunately, was one of the states challenging the constitutionality. Um, they said, well, Congress doesn't have the ability to impose a penalty. And Justice Roberts said, well, maybe not, but they do have the ability to tax, and that's clear. And since this penalty is imposed through the tax code, it's not a penalty, it's a tax. Maybe that's what made it constitutional. It was pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, unfortunately, the other, part that, the other part of the decision was the Medicare, Medicaid, I'm sorry, expansion was coercive on the states because it was requiring the states to take on additional responsibility, and, and uh, so that's what uh, <coughs> I was asking me earlier, is Kansas going to expand Medicaid eligibility, and we, we haven't yet. Now, it's on a, uh, it, as you don't, if, if you don't do it this year, it still could be done next year, but the first three years for Medicaid are fully funded by HHS, but that clock is ticking, so if we don't participate the first year, we've lost it. So then we only get two years of federal funding at 100%. So we'll, we can talk some more about that in a minute. Um, all right. So the um, online uh, marketplace has to be ready by um, by 2014, and I'll, I'll talk some more about that. Let me just kind of give you a snapshot of where we are in Kansas. We have approximately 365,000 Kansans that are uninsured. It's about 13% of our population. We're in better shape than a lot of states. Texas has 26% uninsured. Uh, but it's gone up. When I first uh, was elected uh, to the House of Representatives back in 90, uh, our un 
uninsured rate was about 9 or 10 percent. So it has gone up. It, it hasn't gone up dramatically, um, but it, it has gone up. And 365,000 is a lot of, that's a lot of people that don't have access to health care because they don't have a means to pay for it. And if you don't have insurance, you don't have a medical home, uh, presumably, unless you're, uh, I suppose, some of the uninsured could be independently wealthy and just choose to pay as they go. But um, for the most part, um, people who are wealthy are wealthy because they've made good financial decisions, and it's a good financial decision to have insurance. Even someone with a, with, uh, a lot of resources, um, a catastrophic illness can deplete those resources quickly. So it, it is important that, um, that we find a way for everyone to get covered. Um, most of um, can, most Kansans are covered by employer-based coverage, either in the small or large group market. Most of it, 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 from a number standpoint, are people that work in companies with um, probably more than 100 employees. The University of Kansas, for example, our state employees health plan is essentially a self-funded plan. You might have a, you work for the state, you'll get a medical, uh, an insurance card that says it's Blue Cross Blue Shield, but Blue Cross Blue Shield is really just the third party administrator managing the claims. The state is self-insured, so that means they're, they stand behind the health care cost of the state employees, and many large companies are self-insured. They, they've made an economic decision that it makes more sense to um, put those dollars in reserve and um, pay claims as, as they're needed instead of um, having the insurance company assume the risk. Um, about 30% of Kansans are in Medicare and Medicaid, and um, about 5.5% have uh, individual um, private insurance. That's um, a, a small number, and, and I think probably will will continue to be. I think more people try to um, find ways to buy, uh, to companies try to find ways to provide insurance for their employees. But it could, in fact, increase if you can't be denied coverage based on health status. Then small employers may decide, you know, now's an opportunity for me just to give those. Uh, health, the health insurance dollars to my employees and let them go to the exchange and make their own decision. And um, up to now, that wouldn't have worked because in a small group, you're, this small group, and this is your, to your point earlier, that small group is rated based on the uh, demographic of those, pe those employees in that group. And so someone with a um, health condition could mean that everybody in the group is paying a little bit more, but that person doesn't pay any more than the rest of the members of that employee group. And, um, and that's where, so if, if you can't be rated based on health status, then you could in fact give your employees dollars to go out and um, buy their own insurance because that protection in that small group market isn't as necessary when you don't have um, health status back, uh, rating factors. Okay. Um, just from a, looking at the state as a whole, the southeast Kansas, um, down around um, Coffeyville, Independence, Galena, that Cherokee County, that part of the state tends to have, um, um, be more likely to have residents covered by Medicaid, and, and then Wyandotte County, the inner city of, of Kansas City. Um, Medicaid now is called CanCare, <coughs> started in January, where the state contracted with three for-profit insurance companies with the idea that by better managing the care, they can achieve um, better care and, and cost savings. And, you know, I, I'm all, you know, if it works, it, it's great. If, it, if, it, if they save money just by denying coverage and denying benefits, then I have a little bit of concern about it. But um, we'll, we'll see. The, it's, it's new. There, there were some startup problems, and um, hopefully, they're working through those. Um, the um, Medicaid program in Kansas today is not, to say it's not very generous would be a very big uh, understatement. If you're a single adult with no children, there is no Medicaid eligibility. Uh, if you have a disability, you, you are eligible. If you have a child, children, you are eligible, but, but child uh, adults with children are eligible at 32% of the federal poverty level. So I think for a family of 
uh, for that's maybe seven or eight thousand dollars. It's annual income, so it's it's really not much of a safety net. So the the notion behind the federal law was to expand Medicaid eligibility in the states to 138 uh, percent of the federal poverty level. It's 133 plus an additional five percent. And the um, so the idea was to expand uh, that <coughs> Medicaid eligibility, and then people um, we'd have the the federal government would pay 100 percent of us, and gradually that new expansion population federal government would pay 90 percent and the um, state 10 percent. So it's it's not it's you know it is it is an expansion of the state's responsibility ultimately. But um, if if we don't do this, we're going to have that population still falling through the cracks because they're not eligible to buy on the exchange until they're at 100 percent of the federal poverty level. So between 32 percent and 100 percent, if we don't medic do Medicaid expansion, there is no benefit. Yes. Yeah. No, it's we've never been very generous. It's always been that way. It's, it, it varies from year to year. It isn't a set amount. There's no thing. There's no decision that says we're going to fund Medicaid at X number of uh, at X percentage. So you you back into the number based on how much the state is willing to put in the budget from year to year. So it fluctuates, but I don't think. Since I've been around, it's it's ever gotten certainly not over 40 percent, and it's usually between 30 and 35. Well, who who sets the legislature or the, the, the yeah the legislature essentially yeah yeah and it's really not an not a it, they look at the budget I, they haven't really taken a conscious effort in years past to to look closely at that percentage of um, eligibility. Um, and so, we, and we have about 380,000 Kansans and children that are enrolled in either Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program, and that is more generous. It's up to 250 percent of the federal poverty level. So, so kids can get coverage, but here's the here's the problem with that: if the parents aren't eligible to buy coverage, the parents are less likely to even take advantage of the CHIP program, the Health Wave program. So. We know that, and this is nationally, people in health policy have known this for a long time. If the family doesn't have insurance, even if you offer insurance to the children, they're, less, they're still less likely. There's no medical home, for example. The child doesn't have the capacity to go out and choose a medical home. And the parents are less likely to do that if they don't have coverage. So we know that if we're going to get more kids that are currently eligible enrolled just because of the expansion. Um, so, if, in, uh, if the federal Medicaid expansion was approved, um, it, it would be, um, we, would, we would bring folks up to a, a, eligible uh, at about 30000 for a family of four, or 15000 for an individual, much greater than it is today. Okay, um, so the, um, let's go move on into exchanges. Huh? The, um, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, people who buy um, insurance through an exchange um, are eligible for this for public program and for the for the uh, financial assistance. You won't be eligible for, for financial assistance unless you're buying it through the exchange, including Medicaid. So the Medicaid program will have to be part of the exchange, which is going to be interesting because our exchange in Kansas will be run by. Uh, the federal government, since Kansas did, uh, didn't elect to create its own exchange. So, but but it, the law is very clear. Subsidies are only available if you buy a product on the exchange. Medicaid eligibility is determined by going to the exchange and then being directed to the Medicaid program. So, our Medicaid program has to be interoperable with that with that federal exchange. And um, I think there's a little bit of angst that. The technology is not going to mesh, and we hope it does because it's the people um, that are eligible that would be uh, potentially uh, not being able to get their coverage. So um, we're going to be watching that closely. Um, so by January of 2014, the states have to either have created their own or um, um, 
it indicates that they they don't want to do an exchange, and then uh, they'll, the federal exchange will be functioning in their state. And can we have until February 15th of this year to designate whether or not we wanted to do our own, and we did not. So it was not my decision. Um, 17 states. Uh, and the District of Columbia. So 18 jurisdictions are going to operate state-based exchanges. They're moving forward. That means they're doing, and they were, they received millions, millions of dollars in federal grant money to set up these marketplaces. They're not having to spend state dollars. So expense should not have been a, a factor in determining those. So those, and they're moving forward. Colorado's doing a great exchange. I'm hoping that maybe at some point in the future we can, we could uh, join Colorado in and uh, the um, technology that they've developed for their exchange. Seven states are partnering with HHS, meaning that there are certain key functions that they will retain at the state level. And uh, 26, like Kansas, have opted to be a federal, have the federal government run the exchange. Um, carriers had, uh, people that, insurance companies that wanted to sell their products on the exchange had to start um, submitting their plan documentation um, demonstrating that they're going to cover the essential health benefits and, and all of the other requirements. They started filing in the state April 1st, and they're s slow coming in, and they have to get them all in by April 30th, so not much longer. Um, and then the rec they will be reviewed. In Kansas, they'll be, re be reviewed by us because we we still have jurisdiction over the plans, even though it's a federal exchange, but then they also have to be reviewed in Kansas, have to, have to be reviewed by the federal government as well. So a uh, dual process for companies in Kansas, which is why our, our companies were really hopeful that Kansas would have its own exchange, because it would be much less complicated uh, for them. Um, we, I mentioned that we got to de define our rating areas and, and some of the other characteristics, and we did do that, and we're able to get that submitted and approved by March uh, 29th um, last month. And um, in terms of merging in the small group and individual market, that probably won't happen in Kansas right away, and I'm not sure. Um, I, I think it might be better to keep the individual and the small group market separate. Okay, I mentioned uh, that states could partner with the federal government. These are the five core functions of an exchange. Uh, consumer assistance, that's what we do day in and day out. We are there to answer phone calls. And you get a person on the phone when you call with a question. Um, plan management, that's what we're doing now. As plans submit their documentation, we look at it, we make sure they're complying with all of our state laws, and then the feds will look at them to make sure they're complying with, with federal law. Um, then eligibility enrollment, are that's not a core function of, of an insurance regulator, insurance department. That's really more uh, a Medicaid function. That's where we determine whether, based on your income, you're eligible for, for some financial assistance. And uh, financial management, that those exchanges have to be self-sufficient after the first year. So if Kansas decided in a year or two that we wanted to run our own exchange, uh, we, we would have to have it be self-sufficient from the get-go. Uh, there would not be financial assistance. Financial assistance to help establish an exchange goes away at the end of next year. So I suppose we could decide, decide halfway through next year we want to do a, our own state exchange and, the, and we'd still be eligible to apply for grants. But the, but the, um, the bulk of the grant funding would be um, not, a, not available to Kansas. Um, so we have had conversations with HHS about um, being a partnership-like uh, state not an official partner, but still retain some of the ability to be to answer consumer questions and to do the plan management. And um, and we think we're going to be able to do that unless someone says we can't. Someone being the governor of the legislature, because that's who could that that's who would be able to um, block it. But but we just think it's in everybody's best interest. And and the, and the federal government is. They had no intention of running these exchanges. We, our national association has advocated for years that insurance regulation is a state function. Don't interfere with our ability to regulate insurance companies. Don't take that away from us. And then 26 states are walking away from the ability to um, essentially regulate that key uh, marketplace. 
they didn't anticipate that happening, and it really has um, put them into a fast-forward mode in terms of getting the technology up and running to run these exchanges in, in 26 states and uh, to create the, um, the systems that, that they need to have in place. So they're eager for states that want to take on and retain any of the functions. And we're, we want to do consumer assistance. We think that's in the states, our, our consumers, our citizens' best interest. And we want to continue plan management because it's also in the consumer and the health plan's best interest. Um, so uh, just some of the rules around exchanges, they, it can, in a, in a state that's doing a state-based exchange, it can either be in an existing government agency, it can be a, a new government agency, or it can be a separate nonprofit. And I think uh, more, most of them, not all of them, but, but probably a majority have gone to creating a separate nonprofit with a board uh, of directors and, uh, and working to develop their exchanges that way. Um, they, the exchange makes the qualified health plans available, as I said. It has to create an open enrollment period, an initial open enrollment period, annual open enrollment periods, and then special enrollment periods. Somebody who loses a job and loses their coverage needs to be able to get, um, get the coverage outside of that open enrollment. Yes, sir? A person who's on Medicare and has a supplemental plan, but we have to use the exchange. No, there's none of this. All oh, of this. hallelujah. Yeah, right. <laughs> all of this is is uh, is uh, for um, under the age of, of 65. So it does not. There are some provisions related to Medicare in the law, promoting accountable care organizations, uh, looking at ways to coordinate care in a better in a better fashion, and I think ultimately what what will happen through the Medicare program that will filter down into private insurance is that they will move away from fee-for-service reimbursement to reimbursement based on coordinated care, uh, alignment of hospital physicians, health plans uh, to, de to deliver the best care, um, quality care, promoting good outcomes, and rewarding good outcomes uh, and not just rewarding doing more to get paid more. And that has to happen. The Affordable Care Act probably is a misnomer. It, it doesn't, some would argue that it doesn't do enough to promote more affordable health care. But these, um, moving then the Medicare program, which does drive the way health plans reimburse their providers, moving it into a system that is much more accountable um, for quality of care versus quantity of care. Uh, I think is a is a critical component, and that's the that's the one good thing that's that and and the only really the only thing that uh, affects the uh, the Medicare program. Okay, um, you know I know we're running out of time. Let me look through here. Um, let's uh, fast forward to the essential health benefits. Yeah. Here are I've mentioned that these health plans have to provide the um, create these uh, packages, to be a qualified health plan, they have to offer these essential health benefits. And so these, uh, the Institutes of Medicine and several other um, groups independent of uh, the federal government came up with the recommendations for what should be in the essential health benefits. And, uh, and it, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. It did, ha and, and for the most part, so a state had to look at their existing plans and could select their own essential health benefit package as long as it included all of these things. Uh, and, and we were directed to look at a number of different um, options, but the one that was selected for Kansas, which we didn't select because it was the selection had to be made by the governor's office, but HHS did select the plan that we had recommended to the governor should be the plan chosen, and it was the, the plan with the largest number of enrollees in the small group market. So this is the, the plan that is selling to small businesses, and that's the most popular because it has the largest number of enrollees. So that would be, that would create the least disruption to have that plan be, be selected as the essential health benefits. And, as, and it did, and that was the small, the um, comprehensive Blue Cross plan that is sold and purchased by most of our small businesses. And it does cover all of these things with the exception of habilitated services and pediatric uh, 
oral and vision care. And that, so those two things had to be added to, uh, to complete um, the uh, requirement that they cover these essential health benefits. So um, the, uh, you know, we're, we're moving fast and uh, furious trying to be ready uh, so that when um, October 1st rolls around, that's when people can start enrolling in these health plans. So it isn't that they start enrolling January 1st. Open enrollment begins October 1st. And so that means everything has to be ready to roll by October 1st. Plans have to be certified uh, by, in Kansas, it'd be by this, both, both the state and the federal government. Um, the systems have to be uh, compatible with Medicaid. And um, so we, there's a lot, there's a lot that's going to have to happen between now and October 1st. Yes, sir. What, uh, at one point they said not all the regulations have been written yet. What percent by now have been written? Uh, we're, we're being flooded with paper. Uh, they're, uh, they've, they've, done the, they've done the regs on, a, on a, what do we need, what, what's the most immediate, and they gradually um, are getting to some of the things that are less, less immediate. For example, one of the provisions that folks really wanted in the law, members of Congress, was the ability for an employer to direct their employees to an exchange to say, I'm willing to um, pay this amount for your coverage, and you can choose from the health plans that are on the exchange and apply your amount. And, uh, and um, that technology to allow that to happen, it won't be ready. So they've backed <laughs> off. That they've backed that requirement off for a year. So employers can still direct their employees to the exchange, but they're still going to be able to do like they do today, basically say, this is the plan. If you want to buy it on the exchange, because you might be eligible for some financial assistance, you can do that, but this is the plan I want you to purchase. Well, how, two questions. How does the job of the insurance commissioner change as a result of uh, when all of the ACA gets into effect. How does that, how does your job change? And the second a role, the second question is, if there's all of this kind of uniformity between plans, how do plans compete with each other? Well, good questions, both of them. Our, our role won't change that much because those plans still, there's nothing in the law that takes away or usurps the ability of a state regulator to regulate the plan. They still have to be regulated at the state level. They have to meet all of our requirements. They're, so uh, at, unless our state laws don't, don't, aren't comprehensive enough and then, and then the federal law would, would, um, would come into effect. But essentially, uh, we, regulate, we still regulate the plans. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that's <laughs> important. And your second question? With all of this uniformity yeah. between plans, how do they compete with each other? They're going to have to compete on, on, on quality of service to their, uh, their customers, their ability to pay claims quickly. They're, um, so, um, and they'll still be able to compete within the structure of the um, exchange. There, you can buy a less generous policy, that's the bronze plan, where you, uh, you pay, um, your premium is less, but your out-of-pocket expense could be greater. Um, but it still meets all of these essential... It would, it would still have to meet all of those benefits, but... But, but there, are what, uh, there are actuarial equivalents, and some of that is still to be defined, but actuarial equivalents. So you could beef up some of these benefits and, uh, and, and make your plan more attractive in that way. And as more long expensive. And potentially could be more expensive. And so there are, there are four levels. The bronze plan is, is the least expensive in terms of premium, uh, but you would have greater out-of-pocket expense. The, uh, so it goes bronze silver, gold, platinum. The platinum plan is 90-10. So your, um, your premium is greater, but your potential out-of-pocket expense is less. Well, who wants a comprehensive, that kind of a comprehensive plan? Somebody who knows they need it. So um, you're, you're going to pay up front because you know you're going to be using that, that benefit. Uh, the plans at a minimum have to cover, have to offer at least a silver and a gold. They don't have to offer the cheapest, and they don't have to offer the most expensive. At, to be on the exchange, they have to offer at least a silver and gold. We think most of them will want to offer the cheaper ones, the, the bronze, 
and we think some may decide they don't want the the uh, catastrophic, the the uh, not catastrophic necessarily, but the Cadillac version, the the platinum plan, because it'll get adversely selected. The people that want that, and it and it could become pricey as a result. Yes. Um, the lower N no, no. The no, the, well, the, the Medicaid services uh, already have to be comprehensive, and are, and uh, and and Medicaid eligibility. Then, uh, well, if again, if we don't do the Medicaid expansion, the the Medicaid eligibility essentially right now is for people with disabilities and um, women and w pregnant women and children. And that's primarily, and those and uh, pregnant women up um, and up to a year after giving birth are eligible at 150 percent. Children are eligible at 250 percent. So, um, but that's that's the bulk of the Medicaid population, but it is actually only about a so third what of are the. the It do, if they they're eligible to go on the exchange at 100 percent of the federal poverty level and level, and if they're under that, then unless we expand the Medicaid program, which to me is, is a no-brainer, we should be expanding the Medicaid eligibility because it's it is 100 percent paid for the first three years, and then it's a 90-10 percent match. So, um, but the Medicaid program has has its own set of benefits. It's pretty comprehensive to be in the Medicaid program and to do. Um, to um, and this has been since its inception back in the uh, mid to late 60s. The state says, "All right, we'll participate," but the standards for participation are are pretty well set. So, you, for example, the Medicaid program for children is early and periodic diagnosing, diagnosis, screening, and treatment (DPSCT), and and that's a very comprehensive set of benefits for kids. So it's, it is it is pretty good. Yes, one more question. I think then we're, we're right at 1 o'clock. For those that do not want to participate in, in this, what are the penalties? Okay, good. I, we didn't get to that. That was one of the slides we skipped over. Um, here's a, here's one, of the, one of the issues that can be a problem. I mentioned how important it is that we get people covered. And so the mandate goes along with the, the notion that you're telling companies they can't deny you based, based on health status. The penalty the first year is uh, $95 for the year, and your premium would probably be significantly more than that, uh, or 1% of your income. It gradually increases to around $700 after the third year, and two and a half times, two and a half percent of your, two and a half percent of your um, annual income. So, whichever is greater. So uh, the penalties are are not very steep compared to potentially what the premiums could be. So that is a, that's a big concern, uh, that somehow people will stay out and won't buy the coverage, and, and then we don't solve that problem of cost shifting, which occurs when people don't have coverage, and nothing tells hospitals they, uh, that they can turn people away. Hospitals cannot turn someone away for not having coverage, and that doesn't change. So people will still be able to go to emergency rooms. That's not health care, that's sick care. Uh, you wait till you're sick enough, and you don't get ongoing care if you have a chronic condition. You just wait until the chronic condition flares up and you can go to the emergency room and get treated. So that, that's not a good system, but um, in the long run, we've, everyone needs to have coverage. How big a mistake was it for us not to go into the Huge. To not do the exchange. In opinion, how, yeah. How, well, I how think big it, a mistake was it? We were ready. We were ready. And I, I think it. Um, I I I think it'll be more cumbersome to have to work with the federal exchange. Um, I think it would have been better to have our own have our own state exchange. Yes. Sir? Um, one more question. This might be a good last question. I uh, saw a post, an anonymous post on the Journal World. Uh, comment page 
So it must be true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're considering running as a Democrat for him. Oh. <laughs> well, no to both. <laughs> Well, um, some states, uh, actually I think the only state that has been effective at doing that is the state of Maryland, and they have a cost containment commission, and they approve um, reimbursement. Um, Rhode Island is doing a little bit of that. It would require state law that would allow state regulators to, uh, to step in and... and um, is that possible for us? <laughs> Probably not right now. But, but what, they're, what they're trying to do, though, through this reimbursement, this change in reimbursement, moving away from fee-for-service, is to try to, to get at that um, by better coordinating the care. And, uh, you know, remember the death panels? Remember that debate? Oh, yeah. 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 You know what that was? That was when some, and this was a conservative congressman that put this in the law. He thought doctors should be able to be uh, reimbursed by health by health plans for counseling patients about end of life care prior to it being a crisis in the hospital. Mm -hmm. There is counseling that the hospital can get reimbursed for now, and they he was trying to expand that. And oh my goodness, I just saw what happened. And it was ridiculous. So, but people, you know, I just lost my dad about six weeks ago, oh. and um, he lived 90, I say he lived 96 really great years and had 24 hours that weren't so good. Oh. So he, um, but he had a DNR bracelet on, and um, he, we had had that conversation, and he had a living will and uh, with advanced directives, and uh, the hospital respects that. Now, it's not a fail safe, but but it's but it is it um, it is important that those conversations occur before before it's a crisis. Then you it, you know it's it's just too hard to deal with it then when you're in the emotional um, events of of losing a loved one. So um, I, I I mean I I do think that the the, the, the constant debate is should we have gotten everybody covered first or should we have controlled costs first. Well, you can argue both ways. I think it's important to get everybody in the system. You can't really control costs until you've got everybody in and you stop the cost shifting. And then you know what's needed from a, from a cost standpoint. So, thank you all. Sandy, I need you.